Right. So we'll start by going through the through the quiz. How'd the quiz go? Yeah. Oh, look at that. They're getting all fancy with the website now, too. Upgrading everything. Yeah. So, can't even get the passport. Oh, might be worth uh, keeping, keeping it bookmarked. Yeah. Yeah, that's the other way. Is Google Passport LTCC do the trick too? Then you bypass the website entirely, which I'm not sure is what they're going for, but. I will uh, I'll talk to the marketing people. Be excuse to go have a beer and give them my two cents on their life's work because everybody loves that, right? All right. So yeah, the it is tricky to do the. What did we have? That was not. It was, oh, sorry, it didn't look like it, that one was published. I wasn't sure that was the right one. Um, those Woodward Hoffman rules are tricky, right? And the main thing that it always comes back to is can you draw the two ends with the right face with these, right? And so that's the, the trick. Um, and at this point, we're not getting into anything tricky like charges or anything like that. So basically all we're looking at is counting the number of pi bonds. And then the homo is always going to have one fewer node than pi bonds. Or you can think of it as the, the homo is always going to have the same number of doubled up p orbitals. So if you if we want to look at Yeah, so it is working. Maybe. Um, if we're looking at, that's weird. Let me draw, but it won't let me hit a button on the touch screen. Not sure if that's an improvement. All right, so if we're starting from two pi bonds that are conjugated, that means that we're going to have the homo is going to have one node. Or the other way of thinking about it is that the homo has two sets of p orbitals that are lined up together, right, that look like a pi bond. And the LUMO is always going to add one extra node. So it would be flipping one extra time. So the LUMO would look something like, I was just getting the hang of how, how this thing responded. And now when they updated it, it doesn't line up anymore. <laughs> All right. Maybe PowerPoint will be better. So for the LUMO, we're going to be looking like this. So the LUMO has one. Yeah. Um, it's going to have one extra node, so one extra flip. And so that explains this figure here. And explaining the process is basically, OK, if you can start from these two pictures of an orbital, explaining why heat goes to one and light goes to the other. It's just a matter of saying, okay, well, the two ends need to line up the same phase of the orbital with each other to make the new sigma bond, right? So, and that's a concept that I haven't been stressing that much, 
in terms of, of um, this class, but we've known for a long time that or orbitals overlapping is what causes bonds, right? So this is just an extension of that idea. If we need the orbitals to overlap, they ha also have to be in phase. And so for the, if it's going to be a Diels-Alder or a, a uh, electrocyclic reaction, it's an electrocyclic reaction, we're talking about those Woodward-Hoffman rules. And heat means homo, light means lumo. That's our, our key, right? Oh, so it gets more off the closer I get to the edge of the screen. So as I write closer to the edge of the screen, it sort of starts sloping like that. I don't know why that is. Um, all right, so three pi bonds means two nodes. In other words, for the first one, the ends, if it's two nodes, that means it flips once, then it flips again, right? So if we're I can't get it. If we're trying to make the shaded part line up, it's going to work like that. So it's going to be con rotatory or sorry, disrotatory. And again, I don't really like that terminology mostly it's not because it's wrong but because those of us with a right hand and a left hand what's disrotatory seems like con rotatory because you move your hands the same way relative to your body moving them both outward but that's disrotatory because one's clockwise and one's counterclockwise so it's easy to misinterpret con rotatory disrotatory i do it all the time um, i prefer to just draw the the arrows to show what's happening here right and it's starting with methyl groups pointed outward. So when they rotate the same way, so, or sorry, if they rotate to give it the same phase, this rotatory we're gonna get with a cis product for the first one. If we add an extra pi bond in there, that means our homo, we're now looking at the homo being three nodes, three flips, right? So for a second one, three flips means if we start on one side with the shaded side down, we flip it once, the shaded side is up. We flip it twice, the shaded side is down again. We flip it three times, the shaded side is up again. So this one becomes con rotatory or use your hands and draw that line. So that's gonna give us the trans product. And it's going to be a cyclo octal group with three pi bonds remaining, right? So our final product here, it's going to look like this, and we're still going to have, let's see, Ideally, yours will be neater because you're not doing it on a tweaked out touch screen. Uh, 
Yeah, you, cer you certainly could do that because the ends here are still close enough to each other that you could have it reacting. I think that that the you're going to wind up with the original reactant favored at equilibrium um, to some extent because it does have a lot of resonance. So the and that's that's why you wouldn't go straight to having it to making a six sided ring. Is because you'd be you'd be then isolating one of your pi bonds off by itself where it can't resonate with the remaining two with the other two, um, and same with taking this and then having having the two ends react to make a six sided ring with the four sided ring attached to it. You're going to get some of that. It's not going to be the major product. This would probably be the major product because it splits the difference between maintaining resonance and sigma bonds being more stable. Um, but this is a weird enough situation that, you know, I'm I'm speculating there. We probably would want to actually look at at some experimental results to see for sure exactly what those ratios are. Um, but def definitely worth considering. And then for at this point, we're looking mostly at the ends. Though we're going to say, okay, we're just looking at a single step. We're only looking at the ends of the pi system because that's going to keep the resonance as much as possible. All right, so this one here, this is Diels Alder now, right? Diels Alder is we lose two pi bonds and make a cyclohexyl hexenal group. All right, so in and in this case, our so this is our diene on the left. Our dienophile on the right is still going to have one pi bond left over after it reacts. Plus, it's going to be a bicyclic. So this is going to be kind of a tricky one to draw. It might even be advantageous to pull up uh, mole view. Like I'm going to do that. So I'm not trying to draw this tricky structure with a pen that doesn't work. Has ever wind up going down Wikipedia rabbit holes based on auto? Google autocomplete suggestions. I have no idea what Mulvania is, but apparently it's a place. Um, I would have never known. That's what we want. All right, so we're going to have a six sided ring still, or sorry, a five sided ring still. Not what I wanted at all. Uh, we want to turn that one. That's our sulfur, and we have two methoxy groups attached. Everybody thinks we'll just put our little menus off to the side. It won't get in the way. All the menus then wind up on top of each other. Um, okay, so this is our starting material. It starts with two pi bonds. We're going to break one of those and move the pi bond to the middle. All right, so initially, this is going to look a little bit funky while we draw this, and then we'll clean it up. And then our diene profile is going to be attached at the ends here. 
And I, let's see, I guess we'll make sulfur stick out towards us. And we'll put these ones back and I'll move them closer together. We'll just start that one over. And so these are linked together. Again, still doesn't look that clean yet, but we're going to just make all the right connections here and then tidy it up. We only broke one of the pi bonds on our dienophile, right? So it still has one of its pi bonds there. So we go from an alkyne to an alkene on that side. And then we still have these ester groups attached. And they're going to be attached, it's sp2 carbon, so we don't even need to worry about endo versus exo in this case, right? The fact that we still have a pi bond here means it's not, these two are not tetrahedral carbons. So endo and exo doesn't even matter at this point, which is kind of nice. Um, this is a tricky one to draw by hand, which is why I'm doing it this way. It's easier when you don't need it to look nice the first time. But even if you're doing this on paper, make a messy copy first. Just draw the right bonds, even if some of them are grossly exaggerated for the sake of being able to see what's going on or what pieces started where. That's fine and then take it and try and redraw it in a more standard configuration. If you happen to be doing it on Moldview, um, I'm not sure how if I've ever shown you this, but Moldview has this really handy button called clean structure. Oh, one bond up. So I managed to draw one that doesn't even work with the clean structure because it doesn't like how I drew something. Um, so we'll just do, let's see if we do that. Not a whole lot better, um, but this does look a little bit more closely like a, a bicyclic structure like we've seen in the past, right? Um, it flipped it for us, how, how thoughtful. Um, and if we wanted to see it in 3D, you can also hit the 2D to 3D button and that might make it more obvious what's happening. Oh, no, that really did not work. Um, it tried to make it all planar based on that structure. Let's see if JMOL will actually clean this up or I'm gonna make it, make Moldview work today. ish it's getting there <laughs> so basically all that does is it just wiggles like you just saw all the atoms and anytime it moves when it wiggles things if it moves to, towards a lower energy geometry it keeps that geometry and then it wiggles again and kind of goes in the same direction and so it sort of gradually rolls downhill towards the lowest energy conformation um, it makes a lot of assumptions while it does that. I wasn't sure if that was going to work because it really, really doesn't work well if you do things that are planar. Um, and even this is still not perfect because despite the fact that these two sides are symmetrical, the bonds are drawn as being different lengths. Um, so it's clearly there's some something that's not being taken into account here. Um, but then again, I'm just being picky because once again, this was my, my area in grad school. And we always look down on these really quick, fast methods they call semi-empirical methods that don't actually do the quantum calculations. It just uses some really, really broad estimates of intermolecular forces to kind of get close. Um, but the problem is, is that the uh, larger or the better methods um, scale really, really poorly with number of electrons. Um, the, the most efficient methods scale as n to the fourth, um, where n is the number of electrons. So if you double the number of electrons, that's two to the fourth times longer for the calculation. So two to the fourth be 16 times longer. And if you double the number of electrons again, it's 
another 16 times past that. And so they don't, it's not just double your, the size of the calculation, you're gonna double the time. Oh no. Um, and so that makes sense why they use, why something as fast and easy as MoleView uses these really crappy methods, because it's the only method that's, that works that they could actually host and do on the fly, especially with her molecule this big. But anyway, that's getting into the weeds. And that's next quarter. We'll talk a little bit about computational chemistry, um, at least some of the basic methods. So for some of these other versions of Gilles Alder reactions, the key for these second two is to remember that in order for it to react, it has to be in the S cis conformation, right? We would want to take I don't have this on me, so I do have to still use the. Um, we want to take this confirmation here and do that. Now I can zoom in on it better. We have to flip this section on the left. Right, so we need the two pi bonds to be pointed in the same direction. So what we would actually get for our reactants, and that's a pretty easy flip to make, but we just have to remember to do that for the sake of our um, stereochemistry. So this is what's actually reacting. And then on the other side, it was that's what happened. Um, it's going to look like not like that because it's the trans. All right, so if it's trans, that means we're going to wind up with one endo and one exo once this reacts, right? And again, it can be helpful to draw this as the planar structure and then readapt it. So we're going to start with so the, the four carbons on the left are our starting material here. So we still have those two methyls attached there. These two carbons on the right hand side are the dienophile. There must have been some big update in something because Moleview is not drawing things even the same way. Normally it would make that little bond to a top, to a pi bond look prettier. Um, all right, so we lost two pi bonds, made two new sigma bonds. We didn't make a bicyclic structure, so actually endo and exo didn't matter. We just need to get trans out of these, and then it'd be plus en, right? So those four are these four carbons. And that's this molecule, just so we can see the pieces. All right, so questions so far. On this last one, I'm just going to adapt the molecule I already have drawn here. The ring structure is not going to be any different significantly. The, oh, sorry. Yes, I lost the carbon there, huh? Um, it, easy to do, right? That's why it's always worth going back. And that's, you know, that's a minus one out of four on the test. If you get the right 
right reaction, but lost a carbon somewhere along the way, especially if it's not part of the active side of the carbons, it's not that big of a deal um, because it is easy to do. So for this last one, we don't have a ketone attached. We have cyano groups and we have an alkyne reacting. And again, when you have an alkyne reacting, you only break one of the two pi bonds there. So that's still gonna, we're still gonna have one uh, carbon carbon pi bond there. And then we're, that makes these two carbons that we just added, the carbons from the dienophile are now are still sp2. So no cis and trans there either. So we just have to add our cyano group. And just for the sake of showing it in 3D, so we remember these are in fact 3D molecules. Well, we can clean it up, see how it gets drawn. For whatever reason, it always seems to flip mine from right to left um, when we do that. We're going to get this structure, which is not quite planar. In fact, it'll probably wind up if we do the energy minimiza minimization. One of those words that you say it often enough, it seems like you're saying it wrong, but I think minimization is right. Um, the fact that it's kind of in this sort of boat like structure, it'll probably resolve so that some of these are not totally planar and that ring structure, it looks a little different. And you can see that went, that's going a lot faster with the little wiggling, right? Um, it still kept it more or less planar. I guess, so in order to keep the, the uh, resonance between the two pi, the nitrile groups, the cyano groups, and this leftover pi bond here, you're gonna have to have these two be in an eclipsed state. Um, if you rotate one of the nitrile groups up in order to allow this carbon to rotate down so that the ring, the cyclohexyl ring can be not in a boat conformation, if you do that, then you break the resonance between this CN group and this CN group. So it's predicting that this type of calculation, which again, does not do resonance particularly well, um, is predicting that this will stay in a more or less planar ring structure. I would almost guarantee if we got rid of that extra pi bond there, it's gonna look very different. And now all of a sudden, see how making those two carbons tetrahedral, I guess we didn't specify cis or trans, but either way, it allows this ring structure to be wildly not planar in order to get these two carbons to not be as eclipsed and these two carbons not to be as eclipsed. So, all right. Let's look, is that all there was to the quiz? Yeah. All right, and again, I, I have not graded this top question that's gonna be an explanation question, um, but I will leave some, if you say anything that is close to correct, but use terms backwards or something like that, I'll try and leave some feedback. If you miss any points on this first one, um, double check that I didn't, that I, um, if I, see if I left you feedback, just to make sure that you're not misunderstanding something fundamentally in your head, but still getting the right answers. Um, in general, when it's this nebulous of a concept, I try not to be too picky about how you understand it, but if you say anything that's conceptually wrong, um, then I'll, then I'll correct you there. What about if we break, if we undo an electrocyclization? So making the ring structures, that's our counter pi bonds, find, you know, look, heat means homo, light means lumo. 
if we're breaking them, then we have to get to the right, um, the right orbital shape, the right number of nodes, right? So if we're undoing it by using heat, say for B, well, there's only one pi bond now, but if we, on, if we break this and make another pi bond, there'll be two pi bonds, right? And so we're trying to make something that has two pi bonds, Make sure I draw it right. Yeah, all of. I hate when they update things in the middle of the quarter. It's weird. I guess we're not in the middle of the quarter even anymore. But now I can't draw things properly. All right, so we're trying to get to. So I'm still looking at B in the middle. We're, we want it to get to this structure of orbitals where you have one node, right? It's heat means homo. Two pi bonds means one node for the homo. And we're starting from them already overlapping and we need them to go opposite directions. And so if we're looking at Yeah, I can't even make the ends of my figure eight connect when I do it right at the edge. So I'm going to stop complaining about that. We're starting from this and imagine that that is actually overlapping. And we need them to go opposite directions. So, okay, you know, you just want to start with it drawn like this. Okay, I'm going to take this. They're starting with both of the carbons up taking them and going like this. So now it's gonna put both of my carbons pointed sort of in the same direction, right? I have to take, I have to take this one and rotate it that way. And I have to take this one and rotate it the same way. So that's going to put both of my methyl groups sort of pointed in the same direction when, once it opens up. Right, so that's going to look something like we might be back to drawing with the with the mouse here. And then the two methyls are still on an sp2 carbon. So they didn't really, or sorry, yeah, the ones on the left side of the molecule didn't really change. All right. so. both of the two ethyl groups here that were both pointed up because it was con rotatory in order to put the, pot, the orbitals pointed in the opposite directions, you wind up with both of your ethyl groups pointed kind of in the same direction, both left towards the left if we're looking at the edge of the ring head on. And so the same concept we're just starting from the orbitals overlapping and trying to get to the right shape of the orbitals, as opposed to starting from the right shape of orbitals and then making them overlap. Same basic principle when you're undoing these. We're just, you, you're just changing where you're starting and where you're ending. It even registers as being off. See, look, the little little white thing is where I'm actually putting my cursor, and then you can see where the laser pointer shows up. And it gets more off the closer I get to the edge. Although if I start in the middle, it doesn't. It's not that bad. 
if I start up here, that's actually like half an inch from where I'm actually touching the S in reactions with my stylus. So please be, uh, be patient with my structures today because it was not like this last week. Um, all right. Now I really am done complaining about it. So for B on the second one, same thing, except now we're using light. And if we're using light, that means that we're trying to go to the LUMO, which for a two pi bond system, remember we're counting the pi bonds as though we've already opened it up. Right, so it has one pi bond right now, but we're trying to make it have two pi bonds. And the two pi bond system is going to look like we're going to be breaking that. Um, we're going to be breaking this up to make this. So this is the two by pi bond system we're going to have. We just also have a methyl attached that started out cis relative to the four-sided ring. Right, so this is where we're starting. We've got light. And we're trying to get to this general shape. We just need to know about what do we do with the methyls. So orbital wise, we're trying to get to two nodes. So we're trying to get to this shape. If there's two nodes here. And really the end is all that matters, right? We need the ends to look like this. The rest of the orbitals will take care of themselves. Right, so that means we're starting from them overlapping with the methyls up. So the methyls are on the top of my hands. The orbitals are my thumbs. And we need them to both go the same direction. So we can do that and have the two methyls facing each other. Or if we did this, we wind up with the two methyls both facing outward. Both of those are viable, but one of them due to sterics is gonna be less favorable, right? So the one with the two methyls facing outward is gonna be more common. So that's one. The other one is going to look like that. We'll get both of those. But you're not going to get any where they're where the two methyl groups are pointed sort of the same direction. They're either going to be pointed into each other or away from each other, but not both up or both down. All right, so the opening the electrocyclization reactions are the probably the trickiest thing because it's that one extra step of I'm trying to make this. You can't see all the pi bonds right off the bat. You have to remember I'm making another pi bond when you're counting your orbitals and nodes. All right. Well, that's really pixelated. Um, 
And if you've done, if you do this once, the nice thing about it is if you do this once for heat, doing the same one for the same thing, molecule with light, you're just gonna get the opposite. If you made the trans conformation with heat, you're gonna make the cis conformation with light. They're always gonna be opposite of each other because you're adding one extra node by, by using light. All right, let's get through sigmatropic rearrangements, which are tricky. Um, not as tricky. They're tricky in the sense that it doesn't seem immediately obvious why they would do this. So deals all the reaction. We started with three pi bonds and we end up with only one pi bond, right? We sacrifice two pi bonds to make two sigma bonds. Electrocyclization, we sacrifice one pi bond to make one sigma bond. Sigmatropic rearrangements don't change the number of pi bonds. They just change where they are. You move pi bonds and you move a sigma bond. And the net result is that you move a sigma bond from one place to another place. Which if we're not changing the number of bonds, why would this even happen, right? What's the, what's the point of doing this if we still have all the same bonds? Well, we can wind up making things that are more stable by doing this if we can manage to move our pi bonds so that they're more substituted. Right, back to Zaitsev's rule when we first did elimination reactions, right? The most substituted alkene is the most stable. So if we can do a quick rearrangement of these electrons, that's gonna allow us to form a more stable alkene, that's downhill in energy and that's possible. Right, and but the the general shape of this or mechanism here is going to be the same as Gilles Alder and the same as electrocyclization. It's going to be a, several arrows in a ring structure that have the net result of moving a bond. Right, move a pi bond over, move this pi bond over to make the sigma bond. This sigma bond that's disappearing makes our new pi bond over here. Right, and so this happens anytime you take conjugated dienes, uh, or actually even non conjugated this isn't even conjugated dienes, you take dienes and you expose them to heat and they're big enough that you can have them rearrange. Um, so basically you have to have five or six carbons long in order for this to happen. This won't happen if it's smaller than six carbons or smaller than five carbons rather. And really the, there's really two really common examples that are the ones that you really need to pay attention to. That, and um, most sigmatropic rearrangements are going to be variations of these two. So, and they're both named after the, the chemists who discovered them. There's the Cope rearrangement and the, and the Claisen rearrangement. Um, Claisen was a, re, was a really big name still is a really big name. He actually has three different reactions named after him. He shows up in biochemistry textbook. It, um, there's Claisen condensation reactions um, and Claisen rearrangements. And then there's the Claisen, I'm blanking on what the other one is in. And, yes, that's what it is. It's a piece of glassware, Claisen head or the Claisen adapter in um, organic glassware. So. He was all over the place. Um, and so the COPE rearrangement is when we, when we can move a, pi, a sigma bond and the two pi bonds in order to make a more substituted alkene. So for example, if we look at these two molecules at the top here, both of the alkenes on the left-hand side are only mono substituted, right? And we know that more substituted alkenes are more stable. So if you give this a little bit of heat and time, it can undergo that rearrangement in order to make one of the two alkenes is now disubstituted, which is more stable. So it still looks more or less like the same molecule, still the same number of all the different types of bonds, just that one of our alkenes is, is disubstituted. Uh, 
Um, and specifically, we see this happen instead of seeing an electrocyclization happen because this is not conjugated the whole way through. If we had an extra pi bond here still, then we'd actually see the electrocyclization and make a, a cyclodiene out of this. It'd be more favorable because then we're paying a, a pi bond to make a sigma bond and sigma bonds are more stable. In this case, we can't do that because we don't have that conjugation all the way around. So what we have instead is a sigma tropic rearrangement. Um, the Claisen rearrangement, take, it's basically taking advantage of the fact that not all pi bonds are created equal in terms of what the different pieces are on each side. So it's starting from two alkenes and an ether and it's making a carbon oxygen pi bond. It's making an aldehyde out of one of those alkenes in the ether, right? So a carbon oxygen single bond is not as stable as a carbon oxygen pi bond. That oxygen is so electronegative that making a pi bond is more favorable than having two sigma bonds there. And so, Again, we, we see this rearrangement happen on its own spontaneously, which is one of the reasons why um, organic comp compounds have a shelf life. Part of it is if you expose it to oxygen, you wind up with peroxides forming and you wind up with these, these molecules um, reacting with the oxygen. But even if you keep it completely sealed, if it is exposed to heat, you can wind up with these rearrangements happening or things reacting with themselves. Remember that, um, Cyclopentadiene that we talked about for the Diels Alder. If we had that cyclopentadiene in a bottle by its on its own, it'll dimerize on its own to make a Diels Alder product, right? So even never opening the bottle, if you allow these things, if you allow chemicals to get hot, especially. Um, they have a pretty finite shelf life. Like most things, the best thing you can do to preserve um, chemicals is to keep them at, at a low temperature. Um, so just like with food, just like with anything else, you don't want it to go through too many freeze-thaw cycles though. So if it's something where you're gonna be getting below freezing and then above freezing and it has water in it, you might be better off keeping it a little bit warmer and not having it go through freeze-thaw cycles but if it's something like this that doesn't have any water in it anyway, the colder, the better. It's gonna last longer if you can keep it colder. All right, and so I really, I don't prefer to ask about sigmatropic rearrangements on the reaction section of the final, mostly because it just looks like here's a molecule and then an arrow. And you're supposed to just infer that it's, that it's going to rearrange itself potentially. Um, and that's hard to do. And it, you know, there, it's not like there aren't other things that could happen as well. Um, so the way that I will probably ask or incorporate this into the final would be more as an expl explanatory question. Which side is favored at equilibrium and why? You know, what's this type of reaction called? What's going on here sort of questions rather than just here's a molecule and an arrow, what happens? Um, just be, you know, it's, it's sort of a weird esoteric topic. The electrocyclizations are a lot more predictable and deals all the reactions are a lot more predictable. But the nice thing about this chapter is it really is only three, it's three complicated reactions, but it's only three reactions, right? Diels Alder, electrocyclic reactions, sigmatropic rearrangements is all that we've done in this chapter, and that's it. Um, and this is our second to last lecture. All right? So Thursday's lecture is might be a little bit of new material, but probably mostly review. Um, so this is our, our last major chapter. I, 
what I think I'm going to do is we're kind of kind of end in the middle of a chapter, which I hate to do. Um, but it actually works with this with the next chapter's topic because we're going to get into aromatic compounds and um, and then aromatic reactions and aromatic reactions is like a chapter and a half. And aromatic compounds, how do you know if it's aromatic is half of a chapter so that's what the last topic we're going to cover is basically how do we define aromatic in the organic chemistry sense. So we are at the end of. I have lost count of chapters at this point too. Uh, chapter 13, maybe? No, chapter 12, 16. Is what? Oh, okay. Then we go backwards to get, or do we skip over all of the, there's, there's like two or three chapters in the middle that are mass spec and IR and NMR that are, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Look for the topics, not the chapter number. I'll double check that one while you're on break. Let's come back at nine and we'll talk about aromatic stuff.
All right, so it looks it, we the chapters 12 and 13 was alcohols and epoxides and ethers. Um, and 11 was that synthesis chapter, which was kind of its own thing. Um, so now we're on conjugated pi systems, peri cyclic reactions. So we're down in the chapter 16, and we're going to get the first half of chapter 17. Um, so we'll, we're going to focus on that concept of how do we know what's aromatic or not? And what's the definition in chemical terms of aromatic? Um, and so the, the root of the word is makes a lot of sense. They thought anything that was fragrant, that was a naturally occurring compound, they called it aromatic. Um, we've since come and, and refined that. There's a lot of things that smell fragrant that are not considered aromatic in chemical terms anymore. So they've kind of diverged, even though they started from the same place. Um, so here's an example of, of some aromatic compounds. And the main thing for all of them, they're gonna be these benzene rings. And not even just benzene rings, we're gonna have our, our more formal definition, um, but the most common form of an aromatic compound is going to be something that has a benzene ring. Um, so these are naturally occurring aromatic compounds. Trans anethyl shows up in uh, licorice and maybe nutmeg too. Um, I know mysterisin is definitely a nutmeg. Eugenol we've isolated. That was clove oil, right? Uh, estragol, I think, is. Is that the one from cilantro, maybe? Um, and iso eugenol shows up in vanilla, vanilla in small amounts. Basil, and it was one of those herbs. Um, but they're all things that can be isolated um, using similar techniques that we used last, last quarter. But you'll notice that lemon oil is not on here. Because lemon oil, as despite it smelling very intensely, it's aromatic in the everyday use of the word aromatic. It's fragrant. It's not aromatic in the chemistry sense because it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't meet our criteria. Um, here's just some examples of pharmaceuticals that have aromatic compounds and even this whole thing is considered aromatic. It's not just the benzene ring. The benzene ring is drawn in red, but it's really this other section is also part of the aromatic structure. Um, basically, until you hit something that's an sp3 carbon that's going to prevent any sort of resonance, um, you're going to wind up with it being, you know, being able to be conjugated and resonate pi bonds and electrons around. Um, so, and these, I just grabbed this figure from the textbook. And again, there some, a lot of times we'll talk about the aromatic part of a molecule. So it, it's a little bit like having a functional group. We would refer to the entire molecule as having an alpha, as being an alcohol. But then when we look in at the actual molecular structure, we might say, okay, here's the alcohol more, most specifically, right? So this section here is an aromatic part of the molecule. That's an aromatic part of the molecule. The rest of this in the middle is non-aromatic. We'd still call the whole molecule aromatic. If we're just referring, we'd say that salmetrol is aromatic, despite the fact it has this big chunk in the middle that's non-aromatic. And just trying to be as, as um, consistent as possible. Um, and this one on the right is kind of interesting in that it is sort of a, um, is a third generation or tricyclic antidepressants, a third generation antidepressant. There's the drug discovery um, has goes through these phases where you start from new lead compounds or try to, to manipulate new um, new parts of the of the body or the brain in order to to cause different effects on the entire organism 
Um, and I believe that this is, this is uh, they started from Prozac, which is a more classical tricyclic antidepressant, which I don't actually know the chemical name for Prozac off the top of my head. So it's not actually a, um, this one's not a tricyclic. The tricyclic antidepressants have these three rings and, and as I'm remembering correctly, there were three fused rings. So this Zoloft compound is three ring structures. Two of them are fused, but the third one is not. So when you start tweaking small things about the chemical structure, keeping some of the key components, part of it is figuring out what the key components are and then keeping, you know, the parts of them that work while trying to minimize unfavorable side effects. Um, so you see that a lot with um, um, the classic example is, is cocaine evolving into Novocaine. Anything that ends in cane is a cocaine derivative for the most part. Cocaine was used as a topical anesthetic because it numbs think, your, your nerve endings really, really well. Problem is it's also highly addictive and gets you high. And so they, Tried, they isolated the part of the molecule that was responsible for the topical anesthetic part and broke up the part of the molecule that was, was responsible for the increased dopamine release. And you wind up with molecules like benzocaine, procaine, novocaine, um, that are all to have the parts that work for the topical anesthetic, but don't get you high. Um, so it's just sort of a, it's always fascinating to me because I, re I really enjoy thinking and, and learning about the interplay between biochemistry and chemistry. Um, what can we do to tweak those things? So I, those kind of case studies are, are always interesting to me. Um, and antidepressants, depression is such a complicated disease. There's so many systems involved that there's already been like three major generations of antidepressant drugs um, that are you know, all starting from different places and trying to manipulate different systems in the brain, um, which is, and it's a, it's a fascinating read to just go on the Wikipedia page for antidepressants and read about some of the molecules um, and some of the um, other uses and things. Um, for naming benzenes, we've talked about this a little bit for the most part we either name them with a prefix or they have a common name and sometimes both sometimes the prefix is part of the common name um chlorobenzene nitrobenzene ethylbenzene all make a lot of sense right then you've also got these other ones toluene phenol anisole aniline benzoic acid benzaldehyde acetophenone styrene and these are all just the mono substituted ones there's a there's a whole host of dye substituted benzenes that have common names as well. Um, xylene is methyl toluene or dimethyl benzene. Right? So there, I'm not going to make you memorize all of these. The ones that are on this page are the ones that are most relevant to know the common names. Um, and then anytime you have a dye substituted benzene where you can look at it and say, well, I recognize this part is a common name molecule. So for instance, if we had um, if we had a benzene ring, that had a methyl group and a fluoro group. Well, we can name that a variety of ways, but as soon as we can recognize that, okay, well, a benzene with a methyl group on it, we call it toluene. And I know that I can name halogens just by putting a prefix in front of something. This molecule might have a common name, but toluene is one of the most common ways of substituted benzene. So we would just name this fluorotoluene. And right? so anytime you can use a prefix in, a you know, in conjunction with the common name, um, is usually the, the best way to do it for these dye substituted benzenes. Um, and some of them don't even seem like it's much of a common name, like benzaldehyde barely seems like it's a common name. It seems like it, almost like an IUPAC name. 
um, except it, it would really be something like benzenaldehyde, benzenaldehyde, not benzaldehyde. The fact that you drop that middle syllable makes it a common name and same with benzoic acid. It would be benzenoic acid if it was truly using our IUPAC rules for naming carboxylic acids. So they still technically fit in there, even though their name is pretty close to what the IUPAC name would be. Um, and a lot of these wind up showing up in biochemistry. A lot of them show up in synthetic chemistry. The ones that I see that are less common are anisole and acetophenone. Um, in my experience, are less common, but if you go into the right industries or right fields of study, they're still going to be really commonly used names. So these ones are really worth getting down um, and having them having them memorized just for the sake of being able to to understand when you're reading procedures and things like that. Um, and again, like I said, there's plenty that have common names that are more substituted, like eugenol, all of these, these are all common names, right? Um, if you get to be where it's more than two substitutions, either it's gonna be something where the substitutions are simple enough, it's easy to name with a prefix, or it's gonna have a common name. If all the substitution substituents are different, it's probably got a common name. And it's one of those where build it in Molview, hit the information card and see if it comes up with a common name. Um, what is one other common molecule that has toluene in the name? I'll give you a hint. It's related to the Nobel Prize. Tangentially. TNT. TNT, trinitrotoluene. Trinitrotoluene was first synthesized by Alfred Nobel um, and for mining applications, but clearly TNT has uses beyond mining. And so Alfred Nobel made millions and millions and millions of dollars selling TNT um, to militaries and, and various companies. And so his way of sort of giving back was to found the Nobel Prizes. So he, he, um, all of the money that is associated with Nobel Prizes started as part of Alfred Nobel's um, fortune that he made from trinitrotoluene. Paratoluene, sulfonic acid. So that TM, that's uh, the tosyl chloride, right? Is um, a tosyl group was our para, para, say the full name again. Paratoluene sulfonic acid. So when we added a TS group to make alcohol a better leaving group, we were using this. We we're linking this oxygen to, um, to our compound and which then makes it a better leaving group when it leaves. Um, so we've seen that in this class even, we just used the common so, um, abbreviation for it. it was just TS when we had something attached that way. Yeah, the closest thing I can think of to the to Alfred Nobel founding the Nobel Prizes out of his guilt is um, is the Winchester House. Um, you guys know the story about the Winchester House. The, so Winchester was was a, a rifle used in in the Old West and used it was very heavily involved in the U.S. cavalry putting down Indian re, um, rebellions and things like that. And uh, the guy who invented it left his died left all his money to his daughter who was not the most stable person. And she thought she was hearing voices from people that had been murdered with Winchester rifles. And so she started listening to these voices and she built this giant mansion in the mountains just south of Santa Cruz, between San Luis and Santa Cruz. Maybe it's, yeah, it's in the, it's in the coastal mountains south of the Bay Area. Um, and it's this house with, where the voices told her what to do. And so you've got like, staircases that go up and dead end at a wall with no door 
and like, you know, rooms with no door to get into them, but there's a room that they built and like um, put furniture and stuff like that and then walled it off so you can't get to it from anywhere else. It's just this, you know, before we knew what schizophrenia was and this woman had tons of money and nobody to tell her she shouldn't do things like that and lots of enablers. Um, you can tour it. It's really, really fascinating. It's really unsettling, actually, because things just aren't quite right, but it's hard to put your finger on why. You've never done that tour. You're ever driving down the 101. It's right off of the 101 south of San Francisco. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting tour. I think the Nobel Prizes are probably a more productive use of, of uh, yeah, blood money. Like, no, the, like, no. Like, no. Yeah, just the ghosts. <laughs> right, I suppose. Um, so here's some examples of uh, ways we could use these prefixes um, in conjunction with common names. Be you know, if you have benzaldehyde and you got chlorine attached, it's just chlorobenzaldehyde, and you can name it with the numbers, and that's the best way to do it. But there's also these more old school prefixes. And these are a little bit like saying isopropyl. Um, it's not the most effective way, um, but it is, it's a convenient way of describing something where something is substituted on a benzene ring. Um, so not carbon one is always going to be where the, the dominant group is, the group that gives that compound its name. So one, two, three, four. So this would be four chlorobenzaldehyde. But this para, para means opposite. So if you're just, if we're referring to these two substitutions being on opposite sides of the benzene ring, you can see para or P um, to indicate that where it substituted instead of you seeing a number. Like I said, I don't, it's not as useful and as universal as just using the numbers, but you do still see it. Um, and we will talk about ortho para directors and like, and reactions that preferentially substitute into the ortho and para positions um, is still really common language that's used. Um, so it's worth discussing this. Um, so para is completely opposite. Ortho is adjacent. And then meta is the in-between. So I don't have a great way of remembering. Um, like I don't have a, a, twi a trick to remembering these other than I always wind up O and P go together and meta is the other one. Um, opposite has P in it, but opposite also starts with O. So I'm not sure that's all that helpful either. Um, and the one that I, that I always remember though is meta. If you think about meta commentary or a meta analysis, that's always an analysis of another analysis not an analysis of the original phenomena. So meta generally means either self-referencing or one step removed. If so, if you, you know, if you wanted to, um, so for example, if you had a documentary that was a, about the, um, the criticism of Oscar Wilde's writing, it's not a, it's not a documentary about Oscar Wilde's writing. It's a, it's a documentary about the criticism of Oscar Wilde's writing. That makes it meta. It's one step removed. Um, in its strict sense, meta means self-referencing, but it basically it means not talking about reality, talking about something that's talking about reality. And now that totally throws a wrench in everything. I, I actually have forgotten that. So I think that, that what they're going for with that is it's not the real world, it's referencing the real world. Okay. So you could think of social media as being a meta state. They call it the metaverse as well. It's like, okay, it's not the real universe, but it's referencing the real universe, the physical universe. Yeah. There was my fav favorite use of that phrase is, I'm so meta even this acronym is. No, I'm so meta, even this acronym is meta. If you look at the initials.
pick the first letter of every word is spells is meta. So it is a, a sentence where completing the sentence requires you to reference the sentence itself. So it's self-referencing, it's circular. Um, it's a problem in coding because you don't usually want to have circular references in coding because that causes uh, feedback loops and things like that. Anyway, um, the original use of the word meta, at least in as I'm aware of it, is in reference to chemistry, and it's not adjacent to the first substituent. It's one step removed. Right, so I can I use that to keep them apart. Para is opposite, ortho is adjacent. All right, so if we're looking at stability for aromatics, why we consider these a separate group, they're still conjugated dienes, well, well, polyenes. So why would we consider them to be their own separate category? Well, even with conjugated dienes, if we look at these, so, it takes, you go downhill in energy, 120 kilojoules per mole to hydrogenate cyclohexene. If it's conjugated diene, you go downhill in energy, 232 kilojoules per mole. So not quite double. The extra eight kilojoules per mole is what you get from the extra resonance here. If we took this trend and extrapolated it, then cyclohexatriene, should be downhill in energy 360 kilojoules per mole, roughly. But what we actually see is it's downhill energy 208 kilojoules per mole to hydrogenate. It. So it's not nearly as downhill in energy. There's 152 kilojoules per mole difference between what we would expect the hydrogenation energy to be and what it actually is. So to go from a from a diet from a an alkene to a conjugated diene, it wasn't quite double because we have eight kilojoules per mole of extra resonance. This is 152 kilojoules per mole is a lot more than eight kilojoules per mole to state the obvious. And so what's going on that makes this particular structure so much more stable than just what we get from the resonance here. And so that's what in chemistry, what we re refer to as aromaticity. If something is aromatic, it means it has this property of being way more stable than it has any right to be. And so we can look at that through molecular orbitals. And this is kind of relating back to what we've been talking about with frontier orbitals. Um, if we have six isolated P orbitals and we bring them together to make bonding and anti-bonding orbitals, we wind up with more overlap than should normally be the case. So we actually have one, if all six of these orbitals are at the same phase and overlapping, we get this kind of donut shape, hamburger bun shape, where they're all overlapping. And then we can actually, there's two ways we can arrange these that have just one node in the middle. And so both of these are really stable. We only added one extra node, but because we can make them perpendicular to each other, um, we can actually have two orbitals that are this close to the same energy that are both way more stable than, than we would normally expect. And then we start getting into, okay, well, we have two, two um, vertical nodes, we can range it this way, or we can have three vertical nodes and range it this way. Um, it, but it, it just shows that we can have so much more over orbital overlap than we could even with, um, with these conjugated dienes. But that's not always the case. Just because it's conjugated and it's cyclic doesn't mean it's aromatic. Because, it, for instance, if you have cyclobutadiene, so cyclobutadiene would look like
like that. That's cyclic. It's conjugated pi bonds all the way around, right? But the number of pi bonds that we have and the number of electrons we have means that we don't get that super stable orbital overlap, right? The, the nature of having three pairs of pi electrons in a cycle is not the same as having two pairs in a cycle. So it has to do with the way that the nodes hit the various ways we can divide these up and make them more stable. If we look at cyclooctatetraene, so a stop sign alternating double bonds the whole way around. That's conjugated pi bonds the whole way around. That's a ring structure, we, but it's not aromatic because of the way that have the, the orbitals divide themselves up. When we start trying to add these nodes, we wind up with these unpaired electrons in what are called non-bonding orbitals. They're not anti-bonding orbitals, but they're also not bonding orbitals. And having those unpaired electrons in non-bonding orbitals means that it's not aromatic. And I'm going to give you a better way to remember this in a second so that you don't have to, to go through this derivation every time. So this is what's known as Huckel's rule. And this is like the... Um, You've heard me talk about my old grad school instructor who, who told me he would fail me if I ever said Planck's constant because it's Planck's constant. He also was very, very adamant about Huckel's rule. The, dub, the umlaut means that it's, you say it like it's two of those letters in a row or something like that. So it's not Huckel's rule, it's Huckel's rule. Um, and Huckel's rule is for something to be aromatic, you have to meet both of these criteria. It has to be a conjugated pi system that's cyclic and really, so really it's three criteria. It's, it has to be conjugated all the way around, has to be cyclic, and has to be 4n plus 2 pi electrons. Or the other way of thinking about that, since we're used to thinking about electrons in pairs, has to be an odd number of electron pairs. If it's an odd number of electron pairs, then we don't wind up with those unpaired electrons in non-bonding orbitals. We wind up just with all of the electrons being in bonding orbitals and none of them in anti-bonding orbitals. And so this gives us a really nice, clean distinction. If it meets all three, and I'm going to change this so it actually is, see, it's got to be cyclic. It has to be conjugated the whole way around the cycle. And you have to have, and <clears throat> has to have an odd number of electron pairs in the pi system. All right, so out of these examples here, which of them meet our criteria? Do, they all, um, do any of them um, run into problems with criteria on one? They're all cyclic, right? How about criteria on two? They're all conjugate. There's no sp3. And the second you have an sp3 carbon in the ring structure, it can't be aromatic because you have to be able to resonate all the way around in a circle. But these ones are all good. So then it's just a matter of do which ones have an odd number of electron pairs. So one. Two, three, four, five, 
six. Non-aromatic. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Aromatic. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Non-aromatic. Right, so it's it's that simple. All three of these criteria, though, if any one of them fails, it's either non-aromatic or there's actually certain cases that are called anti-aromatic, where instead of being more stable than you would expect it to be, it's actually less stable than you would expect it to be. So systems that meet some of the criteria, but not all, can be, can be non-aromatic. So for instance, hexatriene, conjugated, odd number of electron pairs, but not cyclic. So not aromatic. Cyclopentadiene, cyclic, even number of electron pairs, and it has an sp3 carbon, non-aromatic. If it's not planar, it's non-aromatic. And so that one's a little bit tougher to predict because cyclooctatetraene, we would expect all of those carbons should be planar, right? They're all sp2. But it can't be planar because what are the, the interior angles on a octagon, on a regular octagon? What are those angles? Anybody remember? It's not 120. If it's not 120, it can't be planar, right? They're actually, I think it's 135. You construct these, you extend this out. You make a right angle if it was a square, right? You make an octagon by cutting off the corners. And so that means each of the two sides of that are 45 because it's an isosceles right triangle, which means you wind up with um, 135 on the interior, if I'm remembering it correctly. Point remains, the fact that it's not 120 means it's not going to be planar. And if it's not planar, if we can't, then it's not going to be aromatic. And really that's, that's part of criterion two, because if it's not planar, that can't be conjugated, right? So there's really, that's sort of multifaceted number two there. It's gotta be planar and you have, it has to be able to participate in resonance. So part of participating in resonance is that it has to be planar. If you wind up with meeting all the criteria, except you get an even number of electron pairs. So if it's planar, cyclic, conjugated all the way around, but with an even number of electrons, it's called anti-aromatic. If it's anti-aromatic, that means you actually have unpaired electrons in these non-bonding molecular orbitals which is really unstable. Interesting, interestingly enough, it means also these can be affected by a magnetic field because unpaired electrons re interact with, um, with magnetic fields, right? That's what causes magnetism in metals. Um, oxygen gas, O2, is actually magnetic because it has, if you look at the molecular orbitals, it has unpaired electrons. Um, based on filling in molecular orbital diagrams. It's actually, it's really, really interesting. If you take liquid nitrogen and you can pour it between the poles of a really strong magnet and it goes right through. If you take liquid oxygen, you can actually pour it between the poles of the magnet and you can watch it curve against gravity because the liquid oxygen is magnetic, which is, it's really interesting to watch. Um, which I think technically makes it a ferrofluid, fluid, but you'd have to keep it at. Let's 
80 Celsius or, or 80 Kelvin or something like that. All right, so here's an explanation of why the odd number matters, why odd versus even gives us these. So these are what are called frost circles. Um, and I believe this whole, this a figure very similar to this is in chapter 17. Mm. Might not be, I might have pulled this from somewhere else. Page 763. There we go. All right, so these crossed circles, um, I'm gonna go through relatively quickly. If you have an odd number of electron pairs, it allows you to draw these orbital energies in a way that doesn't have any non-bonding molecular orbitals. Right, so if it's a four-membered ring, when you set up these orbitals, the way that you can set them up, you set them up like there's a square, and these the two points of the square have to be right on the line, right in the middle. But if it's an odd number of electron pairs and it's a five-sided ring or a six-sided ring or even a seven-sided ring with three pairs of electrons, that allows you to keep all of these orbitals underneath this halfway mark. And so the way you actually draw these is you draw, you actually draw out a regular shape that matches the number of pieces in your um, in your uh, ring structure with one of the points facing straight down. And then you draw a line halfway through the middle, exactly halfway from top to bottom. And then you fill it in with the number of electron pairs you have. If you wind up with unpaired electrons, right on that middle line, it's, it's anti-aromatic. If, but if you have an odd number of electrons, you're always going to wind up pulling up bonding orbitals and having nothing right on this line. And so it really comes down to actually the geometry behind this, which is weird um, to think that and orbital energies is reliant on two-dimensional geometry. That seems overly simplistic compared to how complicated a lot of these systems have been. It really, it's a, it's a 2D representation of these energies. So what's actually happening is a lot more complicated, but we can represent it in two dimensions with these energies using these shapes. All right, so it's not that it's, the whole picture of what's going on, it's a convenient two-dimensional way of representing it. And so this is the probably the biggest single concept that we're going to get into from this chapter. We're not, I think we're timing wise, this is gonna come out perfectly. Um, we're not gonna get into re organic reactions whatsoever and Thursday will be all review. The trickiest thing about these sometimes is recognizing whether you have electrons that can participate in resonance or not, is counting your electron pairs. Because this oxygen has two lone pairs, right? And it doesn't have any pi bonds associated with it yet, right? So that means that this oxygen, one of these oxygen lone pairs is conjugated with the other bonds here, right? So going back to Huckel's rule in those criteria, the criteria are has to be ring, has to be conjugated the whole way around the ring, and you have to have an odd number of electron pairs. So A meets criterion one, it's cyclic. It meets criterion two, it can resonate all the way around, right? 
The fact that it's seven, a seven-sided ring and one of those is not carbon and it has a lone pair. The fact that it has a lone pair means that this, pi, this electron um, pair can participate in the resonance. So it meets criterion two. But what does that do to our number of electrons? That gives us an even number of electron pairs, right? So the fact that A has an even number of electron pairs means it doesn't meet the third criterion. Therefore, it's anti-aromatic if it was stuck being planar. The fact that it's a seven-sided ring means that rather than be anti-aromatic, it'll actually just not stay planar. And so we just call it non-aromatic. Really anti-aromatic only shows up when you have a small enough ring structure that it has to stay planar. So basically, if it's, if it's a ring structure that is three, four, or five sides to the ring, then you might have anti-aromatic character. Anything larger than that, if you try to make it anti-aromatic, it'll just bend and not stay planar. And because it's better to be non-aromatic than anti-aromatic. So remember that every atom that's in a ring structure that's participating in conjugation can only have one pair of electrons at most. Okay. Because the other pair of electrons has to be perpendicular to the, the part, pair that looks like a p orbital. So one of them, if we look at that oxygen specifically, if one of your pairs of electrons looks like an unhybridized p orbital so that it could be part of the resonance, the other one has to be perpendicular to that so it's sticking out perpendicular to the ring so it's not part of the resonance so no atom will ever have more than one pair of electrons part as part of resonance and if something has like for d those nitrogens have lone pairs right but they also already have pi bonds so those lone pairs are not part of the resonance because each of the nitrogens is already contributing to the resonance with a pi bond, right? So you will never count more than one pair of electrons per atom for resonance. So since we're looking at D, cyclic, right? Alternating double bonds or pi, or um, lone pairs all the way around. So everything is participating in resonance. How many pairs of electrons does it have in the resonance? Three, just like benzene, right? So it's aromatic. How about C? So drawing in all the lone pairs. It's cyclic. An odd number. So it's cyclic. Everything can participate in the resonance. And it's an odd number because the nitrogen's lone pair doesn't get counted because it already has a pi bond. Only one of the sulfur's lone pairs gets counted for a total of three pairs of electrons. So that makes it aromatic. What about B? Electronically, it looks just like A, doesn't it? As far as resonance is con concerned. That nitrogen has a lone pair, just like the oxygen had a lone pair in A. So yes, cyclic, yes, conjugated, no to an odd number of pairs.
What about F? I see head shaking. Head shaking, does that mean non-aromatic? Non-aromatic. Yes, it's cyclic, but it's not conjugated the whole way around. So we don't even need to go to counting the odd or even because that nitrogen is sp3 with no lone pair. So it behaves like an sp3 carbon in that respect. What about E? E also has a positively charged nitrogen with no lone pair. Is it closer to F or D? D, yeah, yes cyclic, still conjugated all the way around. The nitrogen doesn't have a lone pair anymore, but the nitrogen's lone pair wasn't part of the conjugated system anyway, right? Just like up here because the nitrogen already has a pi bond as part of the resonance structure, it doesn't need its lone pair to be part of the resonance structure. So that makes it aromatic. That's supposed to be an arrow. All right, what about G? The protonated oxygen. When oxygen is not protonated, how many lone pairs does it have? Two, right? So it's protonated and it still has a free lone pair. So cyclic, still conjugated all the way around, even though it's protonated, the other lone pair can still participate in resonance, which means we've got a total of three electron pairs. So aromatic. What about H? It's definitely cyclic. Both of the nitrogens still have a lone pair that can participate. So if both of the nitrogens have a lone pair that can participate, that gives us a total of three electron pairs, right? So technically, according to Huppel's rule, as weird as that thing looks, it's aromatic. Now, really, it's not going to be quite as aromatic as, as normal, because if we look at the frost circle for four-sided rings, we had three pairs of electrons right here, right? So if we fill those in, we're putting one electron into a bonding orbital and two pairs of electrons into non-bonding orbitals. So it's not really going to behave quite as aromatic as we would expect, but it meets our criteria. So for the purposes of we're using Huckel's rule and not going much beyond that, we would call it aromatic. Really, it would be aromatic, but barely, because it turns out that line that we draw right in the middle, um, that helps us define bonding versus anti-bonding orbitals. And the more electrons you have, the higher that line should be. It shouldn't actually be square in the middle. It's based on how many electrons you have. And so the fact we have three pairs of electrons would actually raise that line just slightly. Um, and I'm blanking on what the name is when we're talking about individual molecules. In semiconductors, that line is called the Fermi level. Um, it's basically use it to estimate like how many electrons you have at Builds it up from the bottom up up to a certain point, um, and I'm just totally blanking on something that I should know off the top of my head. But it's been a long time um, since I was in grad school, so I don't remember what that line is. But it's basically the point where you run out of electrons, 
to fill it up. And so that line would be a little bit higher in, in reality. We're sticking to Huckel's rule though. Cross circles are useful for understanding why Huckel's rule is the way it is. We don't really need to go beyond that for now. So we'll end right there. There's some more practice. We'll go over these at the beginning of lecture on Thursday. And then I will have a practice test out for you, out to you before then. And we can eat, um, you can work on your syntheses projects on Thursday. You can sleep in on Thursday. Um, or I, I have no problem if you wanted to arrange do lab lab time on Thursday after the same time as we would normally have lab on Tuesdays. If you guys want to meet for a review session on Thursday instead, um, instead of being here at 8 a.m., uh, I'm fine with that too. Is it really? Okay, I never get early finals, so that's that's new for me. Um, I always have the, the last finals. Let's see. I have Thursday on my schedule, but I'll double check that. Um, it's totally possible I pulled the wrong final schedule when I made this. So I'll double check that, but plan on it being Thursday, normal lab time, or sorry, normal lecture time, so a week from this Thursday at 8 a.m. right here. All right, and I'll watch for that practice test to go out later today. You don't have to come to lab today, but you can if you want some input on your lab final, your synthesis, any of the write up, anything like that. All right, I'll be here. If nobody's here, then I'll probably leave around two. But if people are here working on, on their stuff, then I'll be here later. Or if you are going to come later, just let me know. Okay? All right. I'll be down. For today, I'll be in lab or in my office if nobody's in lab. 